Good morning and welcome. It is Abby from Action for a Peaceful World and this is course two, lesson two, where we are going to be talking about misattribution, misperception, and overconfidence. Um, three categories of, um, of cognitive biases that impact our decision making. So as I mentioned during our, le our last lesson, I, we are going to be kind of using one of our own personal experiences as a jumping off point to really start to do a post hoc analysis of our own behavior, our own decision making, and with in light of the new information that we're learning about cognitive biases, be able to do um, a bit of an, an uh, analysis in regard to what, are, what were the challenges that we faced and the things that we might have not done as optimally in order to help us plan for better decision making in the future. So we really started to talk about this idea of our autopilot system where we are, you know, our brains are, um, have evolved to be on autopilot most of the time and respond reflexively to environmental stimuli as they come in. And we, con we um, compared this or contrasted did this to our intentional responding system in which we're engaging more of our cognitive processes, our, um, our cortex and our decision-making centers to kind of override that, or that autopilot system in order to make decisions which are more adaptive and uh, more appropriate to situations. So the first set of cognitive biases that we talked about last week were those reflexive behaviors that are tightly associated with loss aversion. Or, you know, we, we don't want things to go wrong. We don't want to, we don't want to lose out on things. Um, we want to get as much good as possible and avoid as much bad as possible. And so our brains are responding consistently to our environmental um, situation in order to maximize the good and minimize the, minimize the bad. But at times that creates a situation in which we cause ourselves more short-term problems and don't get our get ourselves anywhere closer to our long-term goals and so using the psychological flexibility skills that we learned during course one can help to first identify those repeat, repeated thoughts and behaviors that we're having they, it can help us learn how to diffuse those patterns of behavior by honing the skills to get more present in the moment, um, disconnect from your conceptualized sense of self and, and identify who you are as a person. So you can, in the face of those challenges, in the face of that tendency or that urge to respond automatically to environmental stimuli, um, we can make more effective decisions in the moment. So the situation in my life that I'm going to use as a model for you know, doing this post hoc analysis is the situation in which I left clinical practice and moved to Alaska to become an oyster farmer. But the trigger for this and this kind of decision really started at my grandma's 90th birthday party. And it was, you know, um, I'll paint the picture a little bit for you. So I, we, my family and I were living in Arizona at the time. And my grandma um, lived in Washington State in eastern, the eastern part of Washington in a town called Wenatchee. And um, she had recently moved from her home in Wenatchee, and it was the, the home in which she raised her children, my father and my aunt and my uncle. And she had recently um, been moved from her home or had to move from her home to an assisted living facility. And um, 
it, that was really hard for her. And it was, you know, it was really hard for our family because she had been so independent for so long and she had lived in this house since the, um, fit, uh, yeah, the late fifties. And so it was like everything, all of her was tied up into this house and into, into that identity. And consequently, like all of my, like my identity was tied into this house because that was the place where growing up, I felt the most safe and I felt the most comfortable and really learned the most about kind of who I am as a person. And so when I, you know, when I was getting ready and, you know, we were preparing to go to, um, Washington for my grandma's birthday and preparing for her 90th birthday, thinking about all of the memories, all of the, um, just all of the games we played, all the conversations we had, all the pictures we looked at, all of those memories really just, you know, brought up all of these really deep feelings of, you know, that, you know, wanting family, those things that I really value, the family, the connection, the love and the compassion. And, um, my grandma, she has had this beautiful garden. She grew flowers and had like out her back window, it faced out to the side of her garage. And on the side of the garage, there were probably like 20 birdhouses. And she would, you know, she would tend her flowers, she would tend her garden and care for it and love it. She would, you know, go and with her, her morning coffee, her morning tea, she would look out the window and she would watch the birds as they came in and, um, and they, you know, they would, she had families of birds that would come back year after year. And so, you know, I had so much, there was like so much emotion and memory tied up into, you know, my grandma and my family and this house. And because of kind of the situation that she was in, you know, she was beginning to show the early signs of dementia. So she was losing her memory, forgetting a lot of things. Um, and so it just that um, the feeling that I had kind of deep inside was just this, like, this longing, and this urge to just hold on to those memories. And help kind of help kind of take the torch for my family, if you will, you know, it's kind of a big idea of like, okay, well, my grandma was the memory keeper and she was the one who, you know, the glue that held our family together. And I wanted to just be able to, you know, love her and support her and help take that torch and, you know, help with, you know, with my aunt be the ones who take our family's memory and carry that forward. And so, you know, as I'm getting ready to come up for her birthday, thinking about, you know, the things that would be the most meaningful to her um, in terms of a gift or something for her birthday, I had this, you know, great idea of creating a birdhouse picture frame with different sections in it with to have, you know, photo collages of the different parts of her family. So, you know, my dad and you know, kind of our family, my aunt and her family, and then my uncle and his family. And so again, like, it was just like, you know, all of this emotion and all of these feelings that were coming up, all these thoughts and these memories being put into this. And, you know, like I created this like ideal version of what that would look like, you know, like what, it, what, like what me, going to Washington, celebrating my grandma's 90th birthday. And like, that would be, and it was just like, you know, my image, my vision of it was like, oh my gosh, it's going to be so beautiful. And everybody's going to come together. And, you know, she has so many friends and family. She's been, you know, living in this town for 50 plus years. Six, I don't know, probably closer to 60 years. And, you know, just the amount of love and support that, I was just anticipating, right? I was going to go into this really cool um, you know, celebration. So I had to work this all up in my mind. Right? 
And so, you know, I get my, I have my gift and my husband had to stay at home and work, but I, you know, I had my gift with me and I had my, you know, my anticipations with me and I had all these things that I was getting ready for. And I get on the plane and I go, I, you know, fly to Seattle, get on a smaller plane, fly into Wenatchee. And my aunt was planning to pick me up at the airport. And at the same time, my cousin's daughter and her mom were um, flying in at the same time. And so, you know, so we, you know, met at the airport and then my aunt comes and she gets us and picks us up. And it was almost instantaneously, like the first thing out of her mouth was some complaint about my other aunt, my, um, my uh, biological aunt on my dad's side and how, you know, she was being overbearing and she was inviting too many people and she was trying to take over. She was trying to take control. And it was just like the, like negative, like bitchy bullshit. Like it was just nonsense. Right. And it was, you know, it <laughs> took that, like those rose colored glasses that I had coming into, <laughs> coming into this situation about like how perfect and beautiful it was going to be. And I just got like, boom, hit in the face right away with just like this gross negativity. Yuck. Yeah. You know? And, um, and it was just like shocking to me to you know, experience that. And so, you know, me being the person I am and I'm, you know, I'm trying to stay positive and we're here, we're only here for a short time and there's going to be a lot of family and friends coming in. And so it's like, I don't want this weekend to be consumed by negativity and complaining. And so I, I asked her to, if we could just like keep, keep the conversation light. We were, you know, it was early morning. I had just gotten there. I had like, you know, I was like really excited to see my family and see my grandma. And, um, and so, you know, we were getting ready to all go out to breakfast and she, you know, she picked me and my cousin and her daughter up and we, um, we went out to breakfast to a small diner. And on the way there, I asked her, I, was, I asked her if we could just keep the conversation light and positive and just, you know, we're here to focus on grandma and her birthday. And okay, you know, if you had problems with my other aunt leading up to this event, I'm, you know, I'm sorry that happened, but I think we can all, you know, be adults and move on. And, um, and so she, you know, she respected that. We went out to breakfast, we had a nice time, a nice conversation, caught up, blah, blah, blah. And, um, and so then, you know, after breakfast where, you know, it was scheduled, the other family was going to be flying in later that day. And so kind of that morning was, you know, and most into the afternoon was just going to be resting and relaxation and kind of think, you know, planning. And, um, so, you know, we go back to my aunt and uncle's house and we're just hanging out and oh, oh, half, like later in the day when, Again, I'm anticipating, you know, family's going to come in, we're all going to get together, we're going to have dinner, you know, have this like family reunification. I, um, you know, had, I had this idea that we were going to go out to dinner, but it turned out because they were fighting and because they were having this disagreement and they didn't, you know, they weren't really liking each other at the moment, then the two sides of the family, my aunt's side of the, my aunt's family and my uncle's family were, you know, planning to have separate functions, separate dinners. And so here's me coming into this situation with all of these anticipations and then being kind of caught in the middle of like, well, I want to spend time with this side of the family. I also want to spend time with this side of the family. And it just seemed it was so unfair. It's like, what is happening here? This is ridiculous. But what I really started to see and I really started to notice in that situation was the pervasiveness of this continual problem of these repeating patterns of behavior within my family. So, you know, at the birthday, my aunt was and her family were there. My uncle and his family were there. My dad just had had because of previous um, interactions with the family had decided not to come. 
not to come to his grant, his mom's 90th birthday party during which all these other things are happening. My grandma's, you know, moved, moving out, moved out of her house, her estates being sold. Um, you know, she's losing her memory. She moved into assisted living, like all of these things again, at, you know, from my perspective, like put your differences aside and let's just move forward as, as a family. And, you know, and, uh, you know, celebrate this woman who has been literally the rock in our family. And so I, um, so I ended up leaving my aunt and uncle's house and going out to dinner with my other, my aunt and her family. Um, because again, they were, had, they had to be separate. And so whatever. And so I go out to dinner, um, with my aunt and her family and they, almost immediately, the first thing out of her mouth is something derogatory about my grandma and how she's so frustrated about her memory loss and she never remembers things. And she's, you know, just like, nah, like just nagging and nitpicking. And again, I was just like struck by what in the world is happening right now? I, it, we're all coming together. This is supposed to be fun. This is supposed to be exciting. This is supposed to be a celebration of this woman. And all that the, these people can do is just like bitch and complain and point fingers and blame and shame. And I was just like, this, my vision of what this was supposed to look like is completely shattered. I mean, it was just like, you know, I was up here, it was going to look like this. And it, you know, what I stepped into was just like a cesspool of toxic waste. And at that point, I reached, I exceeded the limits of my window of tolerance. And so, you know, your window, window of tolerance is that area in which you can, you know, you're calm, you're open, you're centered, you're engaged. Um, you're not hyper aroused and, you know, anxious. You're not hypo aroused and, you know, kind of disconnected. You're just like right here, right now in the moment. And my window of tolerance at that moment had, was far, far exceeded. And so given that, like, I have a tendency to um, respond emotionally to situations like that. I have a hard time talking um, in emotionally laden situations, especially with family, when there's a conflict or a confrontation, I'm much more likely to uh, be the, be the pleaser, be the appeaser and, you know, just try to bring down, okay, let's just bring it down and let's everybody just get along and we're just, you know, pretend like that didn't happen, um, or cry, run away. But at that moment, my reflexive response to wanting to get out of that aversive situation because it was really aversive. I was really upset about how everything was going down and how far away from my expectations it had been. It was that I lost it. And I found myself kind of, you know, I was like on autopilot. My, my, like my lid was flipped. I was not thinking rationally. Um, I was thinking very emotionally and I was responding and I was on a mission to make a point to my family about how I really thought and how I really felt about what they were, like what they were doing and what it really meant. And so I found myself in the middle of my aunt and uncle's living room yelling at my like literally like circled around people are sitting on couches and i'm standing in the middle of the living room yelling at everybody even people who were like not involved in this situation except for that they're there for my grandma's birthday about how disappointed i was in their behavior and how they really all needed to grow up and get their crap together um, it wasn't my finest moment. I made a point. Um, do I believe that that was actually like the, you know, that was the right way to go. That was the right way to spawn. That was the, you know, the thing that needed to be done to influence change at that moment. Well, no, looking back, that's, you know, it, 
that's not how, you know, that's not how be effective behavior change works. But I did, you know, I did get my point out. I was able to communicate. It was, you know, it was pretty clear, but it was very emotional. And we know that like on the receiving end of information or emotion, it is really hard to you know, listen to that and to really hear what somebody is saying when it is said in a way that is like overly emotional, blaming, finger pointing. And so it wasn't, you know, not my finest moment, not the most effective way to handle a situation, but it was what it was. I, you know, I was outside of my window of tolerance and I was not thinking rationally and I was not, you know, I was not making the most, um, I was not making the best decisions, but it was that, that urge to advocate for someone that I loved so much, right? I was at, trying to advocate for my grandma and the fact that um, we as a family should be much more compassionate and thoughtful about what she's experiencing. She lost her husband. She lost her home. She's losing her memory and she, you know, moved to an assisted living facility. She's like, everything that was her is now like, she's losing it. And I, and they didn't seem to like get it. And I attributed that a lot to just those internal characteristics. It wasn't, you know, hindsight. I can see now that like, you know, all the things that both of my aunts were going through, my, you know, my aunt and uncle had, you know, they lived there near my grandma. So they saw everything. They were there all the time. They were, you know, they were hands-on. I was out of state. My aunt, um, you know, being the oldest daughter, she was given the responsibility of selling off the estate and managing my grandma's finances and all of that. So it's like she was under a lot of pressure as well. But my perception, like I didn't even like see that as a source of their, like their patterns of behavior. You know, my interpretation was like, you're selfish and you're a bitch and you don't care about this woman and you feel like all of these labels that are like very not nice things to like think or say to people um but it was like that was how i felt right i was like again i had this huge um like rosy picture of what it was going to look like it didn't turn out that way it was absolutely the opposite and that just like through me. It just really like spun me out. And so, you know, being the thoughtful, you know, rational person that I am most of the time, like outside of those situations, I realized very quickly that like that, um, the way that I approached the situation was not like, it was not appropriate it, you know, it happened. And so I, you know, I take, oh, I took ownership of it. Um, but it did, you know, it did open up an opportunity for my family, me to have more in-depth conversations with different parts of my family. And by the end of the weekend, it was all like, it was all pretty gravy, right? It was, you know, they were, everybody was just kind of like, okay, we're here, we're going to celebrate and everybody's going to put on their happy faces and keep their negative Nancy's to themselves. And we're just going to move on. You know, and I was able to, I, you know, I can, I, uh, spent a lot of time with one of my cousins who I had, you know, hadn't spent time with in a really long time. And we really connected on a, you know, on a deeper emotional level, um, and, you know, reminiscing about things from our childhoods. And, you know, so it ended up being really positive, but I knew at that moment that I needed to take one more step at least to ensure that the memory, the thought that my, you know, the three adult children of my grandma were left with wasn't like Abby standing in the middle of the living room, like crying and yelling and telling everybody they're jerks. Um, I really wanted to be able to like make my point clearly that this was coming from a place of like 
care and compassion and family and connection and love and really deeply held values that um, in that moment, because what I was seeing, what I was surrounded with was so far distant from those values that it, you know, evoked this really emotional and like almost aggressive response. Um, kind of in response to that loss, like being averse to the, like the loss of my image of what this was going to be. And so on my, on my flight home, I ended up composing a letter that I sent, I, you know, ended up later sending to my dad and my aunt, my uncle. And, you know, at this point, um, you know, thinking, going back to kind of that point in time, I didn't know what influence it was going to have, but I just knew that I needed to get my point out there in written form, in, you know, very clear, very concise communication. So they had, even if they didn't agree with it, even if it didn't do anything to change their behavior, at least I knew that they had accurate information to read and consider. And, and so that's what I had put out into the world. And so this situation was, yeah, you know, the, that it was the straw that broke the camel's back. It was that event in my life that took me from kind of being this, you know, in clinical practice, you know, going through the motions, being burnt out, being just like, you know, surrounded by broken systems going into my family and realizing like, oh, not only do I work in a broken system, I come from a broken system. And, and all of the things, you know, that was my first indication that like all of the stuff, all of that emotional responding that I was dealing with and all of the difficult time I was having, um, coping with things in my environment, probably had to do something with that, with something that was much more deeply, um, you know, held. And so, you know, something that was had its source, not within the company I was working for my career, but really had its source within my family and my upbringing and that history of um, traumatic experiences. And so, um, so that was the, that was the trigger. That was, that was the, that major event, life event which got me to start thinking that I need to make some changes in my life to really address my core challenges and so I can move forward in a more effective and efficient way. Um, okay, so today what we're going to focus on in regard to the cognitive biases that we're talking about um, are talking about misattribution, misperception, and overconfidence. And so the objectives for today are to differentiate between attributing behaviors to internal versus external variables, um, defining actions necessary to, pre to uh, prevent judgment errors and um, by avoiding uncomfortable discussions, and then analyzing risks associated with overconfidence during the, the decision-making process. 